Gentlemen, we haven't, we haven't got nearly long enough to cover the, uh, your amazing achievements in, in the world's greatest murder race. Just give us a sort of a flavour of why Le Mans remains such a challenge and such a, an important race that everybody wants to do and win. The funny, thing is, the funny thing is, to start with, I never wanted to do it. It was never a challenge that I had a dream about doing. All the top drivers of that time, back in the 70s or six, late 60s, you know, they uh, did Le Mans as part of the programme. And of course, if you race for Ferrari, you did Le Mans and you did uh, the World Championship as well. And I never had a dream to do Le Mans. And then out of the blue, I got the chance to drive the GT40 at Le Mans. And I was under contract to Mr. Ferrari at the time. And uh, he wouldn't release me, strangely enough, from my Ferrari contract to drive for Ford at Le Mans. So I didn't go. And of course, Pedro Rodriguez, who was going to be my teammate, won the race that year. So that would have been nice. But so I went back two years later. And of course, then I went with Ferrari in the 512S, and that was the beginning. And then you start to realize what an important race it is and how important it is to win it, you know? In the old days, it was very much a, an endurance event. It wasn't the flat-out sprint that it is now. It was very, very tough to finish. Well, that was it. I, I think we must, we've got to be careful, because he's driven a lot of Le Mans, and even in the times that you might say, well, you didn't have to drive flat out. The fact is, we always drove flat out. The difference was we weren't allowed to use all the power. A, because we had a fuel economy thing, plus the fact was you look after the gearbox, because if the gearbox goes, we lose two hours changing it. Whereas with Audi, they changed them in four minutes. Uh, we took two hours to change in the earlier days. So consequently, you had to really look after the car. And uh, although once we were in it, we drove flat out, even in the years with the 956s and the 962s, we still, um, you know, drove flat out into the corners, but we had to, had to take it slower on the straight to save fuel. So we'd get to the corner and then become absolutely animated and flat out through the corner and then calm down and drive coolly to the next slip streaming off 911 Porsches all the way. So it was never easy. I mean, whatever you're doing in any race to try and win it is difficult. Emmanuel, Actually, yeah, what I was saying, now most of the retirements are happening because of accidents. And I think earlier on, uh, there were a lot more mechanical failure than, than accidents, thank God, because accidents before would have been a lot more, or were a lot more dangerous. Now, when you start a race like Le Mans, you really talk to yourself and you think, God, don't make me screw up, because you think screwing up, uh, sorry, what is the synonymous of screwing it's up? Really, That's screwing fine. up's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank In you. In a making a mistake <laughs> context, yeah, it's make, okay. Don't make me make a mistake, <laughs> because this is basically, if you're lucky enough to drive for a, for a big team, like, like Audi, uh, breaking down is, is just something you don't think about. Um, making a mistake is something you, you do really think about because there's so much work um, before the race, you know, and it's only happening w once a year. It's a little bit like the Olympic Games, you know. If, if, you, if something goes wrong, you have to wait a whole year. And so many people work so hard, you know. Forget about the money, the investments, because money come and go and, and a manufacturer has got money. But so many people work so, so hard to put you and your teammates in the, condition, in the best possible situation to win the race. And it's a balance between, of course, trying to drive as fast as possible, which is, which is motor racing, but not making a mistake. Fortunately, you know, drivers are a little stupid at the end of the day. But when you put your helmet down, you don't think so much about these responsibilities and you just try to do the best job you can. But the responsibilities or pressure you feel it's uh, it's it, it is quite remarkable can I ask you a question guys how many of you have been to Le Mans physically oh, I like that yeah. because Good. they used to come yeah, yeah. It, it, there's so many <laughs> British and uh, I still haven't made my dream which is going to Le Mans as a pure spectator with a tent because of course I, I went as a racing driver now I'm working for Audi so I go there without racing but still working but my wish would be just to go as a race fan, which, as I am, just to enjoy the race. It's, I think it's like when I try to describe to people who don't know, I say it's like a Woodstock of uh, motor racing. You, know? mm -hmm. you share the passion with so many people. You hang around. You can drink. You can party. You can, it, it, it's just a fantastic place, and it's hard to describe. Emanuele, was Le Mans on your radar, though, when you were racing in Formula 3, 3000, Formula 1? Uh, even worse than that. I was uh, I started racing in a f in a equivalent of Formula Ford Formula uh, Fiat Abarth in Italy when I was 18. I, I won the championship as as a reward 
the Fiat Lancia group, they took me to Daytona and Le Mans. In those days, it was part of the World Endurance Championship, as uh, Derek remembers. And Lancia Martini was a big, big team, actually, a World Championship yeah. winning team that year. I was a junior. They took me to Daytona, which was my very first race outside of Italy after a 25 minutes race of Formula Fiat at Bart. First race abroad was the 24 hours of Daytona, which went fantastic. We were fifth overall, won the class, brought the points for Lancia, fantastic event. The next one was Le Mans. I actually drove Le Mans in the Go-Kart World Championship with Ayrton Senna in 78, so only three years before. And I dreamt about doing this race, and I couldn't believe that only three years later I was doing the, the big race. But it was a, a big nightmare, uh, uh, so bad. I only drove one hour. In this one hour, at the first uh, full racing lap, I saw one accident when, where a driver got killed, uh, Jean-Louis Lafosse. Yeah. This is 1981. Um, I was sharing the car with Beffe Gabbiani. You cannot believe, as a, it's always terrible to see somebody losing his life in a race accident, but when you're a kid, it was a shocking thing, especially because I thought naively that, you know, motor racing is dangerous, but you can kind of control the risk, and the more you risk, the more, the more chances you take, the more you risk, but it, it's up to you. In that case, in Le Mans, it's not up to you. The car breaks down on, on the straight at top speed, and you're just a passenger. So we drove uh, on, on this uh, behind the pace car uh, several laps, and we saw this horror thing. Then there was a green flag, one full speed lap, and again another big crash where Terry Butson killed one marshal, and, and it was, guys, it was horrible. Then I finished my stint with only one green flag lap and all this horror, shaken and, and really, really in shock. Beppe Gabbiani takes the car. I'm ready to, to get back one hour later. It doesn't pass by. And, you know, in those days, there was no TV, no communication. Le Mans is very big. And then it doesn't come. And then we hear uh, uh, news saying car 67, Lancia 67, crashed on the straight, caught fire, driver is killed. Oh, no. Oh, no. Please, God, no. Fortunately, the crash was true, but Beppe was okay just because there was such a a Most. bad atmosphere that, you know, the bad news became worse. And uh, Beppe and I, we were so much in shock, we drove away and I, I looked back to the, to the town when I was in the motorway and I said, never again I will go to this place. And then so many years later, it's, I, it, it was, I found a different place, such a fantastic, uh, it, Le Mans has been so good to me and uh, it's like a hell and, 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 uh, and heaven in one place. You would have been involved in oh, John Wolfe, Joe Bonnier, Joe Gartner. There were, it, it, did it put you off? Did you think? Well, it, it did. I was in the race. In fact, we won that race the year that you had that tra those tragedies but, um, in the Jules 936. But that's beside the point, really. It's very difficult to be on the winner's rostrum. And, um, you know, bear in mind that tr two guys got killed. Uh, we don't always know about it. Um, I, I invariably didn't want to know what had happened. You've seen an accident, you didn't want to fear the worst, and the team wouldn't normally tell you. So it was just as well, otherwise I'm sure I'd have stopped you know, in the race for some reason or other. I was just very lucky that it was never my teammate, and, um, apart from when Stefan Beloff died at Spa, and that he wasn't my teammate, but he had been the year before. So we stopped racing then, but basically overall, I mean, it, it was very, 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 very dangerous. It still is, you've got to realize that we're, we put our foot down in fifth gear or top gear, and for one whole minute down the Mulsanne straight, as it was when men were men, there were no chicanes, of course. But as we go down the straight, <laughs> foot flat to the floor for one whole minute, that's 60 seconds at full throttle. And uh, over, you get down there so fast, you can't believe, 235, 245 miles an hour. Very, very fast. But believe it or not, it was the only time you got to relax because the car was so damn perfect. Every car I drove there, well, apart from one, was really beautiful to drive down the Mulsanne Strait. And that's what you need. And if you have that confidence, you know you're all right. They, by putting in the chicanes, they think that they made it safer. And I'm sure they have in many respects. But you're putting a lot more loading into the cars. 
under braking, turning in, braking again, and a lot more loading into the drivers physically. And then you have the new section, you know, after the Dunlop Bridge, which has become more arduous from the physical point of view. So they're putting more stress on the cars, which is all, you know, all com compliments to the top teams like Audi and Toyota and Peugeot and people that have made their cars so reliable, because I swear ours wouldn't have lasted. And people say, tell us some anecdote, you know, funny anecdotes about, you know, motor racing. There isn't much that's funny that happens at 200 miles an hour, to be honest. But that was one of them, and I'm sure if I thought about it, there'd be other ones that I could think of. But we, we always had a great sense of humor about things. I know that um, standing on the podium with your son, Justin, uh, in 94, Four. Five. 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 In the Harrods McLaren was, yes. a, was, a, was a really special moment for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, I was only asked to drive with Justin and uh, was it Andy Wallace? Yes, I was only asked to drive with them in the McLaren about three weeks before. And as he knows, you start preparing for Le Mans in January. So I started preparing. I'd retired basically from Le Mans uh, about the year before. And so they said to me, come on, you're going to come with us to Le Mans. So I went with him. And uh, we had an amazing race, which I won't tell you about now. It's all been written about. We had an amazing race, and we're leading for 16 hours. And then as it came to the last two and a half hours, it dried out. And therefore, they had to... And, and at that point, this McLaren gearbox was never meant to last 24 hours, but it had been good in the rain. Uh, but of course, as soon as it got dry, it, it, it put too much pressure on it, and we actually finished third. But to actually go up on the winner's rostrum on... Father's Day with your own son and Andy Wallace, because we couldn't have done it without him, that's for sure. It was pretty spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. Now you can do it on Grandfather's Day, maybe. Huh? <laughs> Brilliant. No, I've got a 13-year-old son now as well, so we could go with oh, plenty of time. both my sons. Yeah. Anyway, um, not anymore. Guys, I, I could listen to this all day, but we've all got schedules, sadly. Uh, we've got to uh, end it there. Thank you for sharing some of that with us. Um, it was very funny. Very funny. Yeah. Can I thank I you guys <laughs> for listening and wish you a fantastic 2013 and enjoy the show. Thank Cheers. you very thank you. much. Emmanuel Pero and Derek Bell. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers.